Hi, this is Manos Berlakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting case 92 for the manual of percutaneous coronary interventions. This is a case of PCI of the last two remaining vessels in a previous coronary bypass graft patient. The patient had ischemic cardiomyopathy, ejection fraction of 29%, had previous bypass, had ICD implantation, AFib, chronic kidney disease with a creatinine of 2.25, which was his baseline, and he came in with multiple ICD shocks. As a result, he was referred for coronary angiography. The LAD was known to be occluded with no viability in the anterior wall. There was this new lesion in the origin of a fairly large ramus branch. The right coronary artery had uh, a near occlusion in the mid-segment after this acute marginal. However, there was a patent saphenous vein graft to the distal right coronary artery that was supplying the posterolateral and the PDA. However, there was a high-grade lesion at the origin of the right posterior descending artery. The right posterolateral was in good shape. And this is a different view, the area of view, also showing the high-grade lesion in the origin of the right posterior descending artery. There was also another occluded graft to the left. So the question is, what to do here? And the number one question is whether we should do revascularization or not. And clearly the patient is having ICD shocks. Ischemia was high on the differential. So revascularizing the ramus and or the PDA was uh, the most indicated course of action. Now, one could argue whether one should fix one or the other. However, they both appear to be high-grade lesions, and it was hard to separate which one was the culprit for the patient's ICD shocks. So the plan was to perform revascularization. The patient would need careful monitoring given low ejection fraction. Pretreatment is important, so the patient did receive aspirin and clopidogrel loading the day before. Access, uh, we used femoral access, which is our preferred access for patients with coronary bypass graft surgery. Engagement uh, and uh, angiography were important here. Angiography especially, as we will discuss later, was critical for wiring the target lesion. Wiring of the ramus was straightforward. However, wiring of the PDA was challenging. And then uh, imaging is important here to minimize um, the amount of contrast given. And when it comes to hemodynamic support, this is a patient that has a high-risk PCI because these are his last two vessels. The ramus and the right coronary are the last two remaining vessels. The LAD is infarcted and occluded. And the patient also has abnormal hemodynamics. We did not do a right heart catheterization here, which we typically would do these days. But based on the ejection of 29% uh, and the high-risk PCI, it was decided to use hemodynamic support, and uh, Impella was the device that was used. Uh, the patient did have good iliac arteries and femoral arteries on the left, and therefore an Impella was placed through the left common femoral artery. The next question is whether we should start with the ramus or the PDA, and we decided to start with the easier lesion so as to make it safer when doing the PDA that seemed to be a little more challenging for wiring. So the lesion was predilated with angioscout. We do have a good expansion. And then uh, placed a 3.0 by 18 millimeter drag eluting stent. And then did intravascular ultrasound that demonstrated a big vessel. The distal portion of the stent was a little smaller than the proximal, so a little stent uh, under expansion on the distal segment. And that is why it was post dilated with a 3.5 millimeter NC balloon that uh, gave a nice result. The patient did remain stable during this part of the procedure uh, without any chest discomfort or other hemodynamic compromise. We then changed to the right coronary artery. We are engaged the SVG with a multi purpose guide. We did insert a workhorse wire in the posterolateral branch. But then we did have a lot of difficulty getting into the posterior descending artery, which had a tight osteal lesion. We did um, try with uh, different guide wires. That was a C on blue. Then we also tried with a whisper wire. Once again, we had difficulty getting in. This is the workhorse wire that is located in the right posterolateral. 
but getting through this tight lesion in the ostium of the PDA was very challenging. To facilitate this, we used a microcatheter. So this is a 135 centimeter Corsair inserted to the distal right. But once again, we were not able to get through. So what to do when there's challenging wire? We go and revisit all the steps of wiring. So the first step is whether a microcatheter is needed. And microcatheter can improve the handling of the wires and was tried in this case with a Corsair. Another option would have been to use an angulated microcatheter that could help take the bend into the PDA. In terms of guide wire, as we'll show you later, the workhorse wires is what we start with. But if this doesn't work, using different types of, of wires, such as polymer jackets, can be useful. Another tool is to change the shape of the tip of the wire, which is very easy with the microcatheter, so we don't have to lose any ground gain. Also, important to use the torqueer. When wiring is challenging, the torqueer provides a better response and better torqueability of the wire. In terms of bends, for CTOs or complex lesions, small bends are used using an introducer. However, here we wanted a larger bend, so we use the side of the introducer to make a larger bend on the guide wire. In terms of selecting guide wire, once again, we started with a workhorse, Sion Blue, like all the time. A wire that is very useful for tortuosity is the SUO3. That was not available at the time of this procedure, but can be very useful. It's a 0 0.3 gram wire. But if this doesn't work, then the next step is typically to use a soft, non-tapered, polymer jacketed wire. And those wires are the Whisper, the Pilot 50, the Fielder FC, and the Sion Black. So those wires are more slippery and potentially more likely uh, to take uh, those bends. And as we discussed, having a microcatheter essentially creates this telescoping system, enhancing the manipulation of, of the wire compared than if we don't use that. If this don't work, advanced solutions for wiring through tortuosity are to use less prolapsing wires, such as the pilot, use an angulated microcatheter, such as the Supercross or the Venture, use the reversed guide wire or hairpin technique, or use the deflection balloon, and this will all be discussed in a separate video. However, in this case, what we did was different. What we did is actually change the view, because we realized that we were not appreciating entirely where the PDA was coming off from the distal right coronary artery. So we used a view that is not commonly used, but can be extremely useful, and this is the lateral view. The lateral view does have more radiation exposure. However, it opens up very nicely the RCA with marginals and also the distal RCA with the PDA PLV bifurcation. And we can see here how nicely it opens up the bifurcation. This is the posterior lateral vessel. This is the workhorse wire going in a branch of the posterior lateral. And this is the PDA that we've been trying to wire with our wire. And by using this, uh, we were actually able to advance our workhorse Sion Blue wire into the posterior descending artery, pulled it back, uh, redirected it, and the wire was nicely advanced down the vessel. So the lateral view really helped us wire the vessel. Then we predilated with a 2.0 by 20 millimeter balloon, and uh, that improved the stenosis. So now we have here a branch ostia lesion to treat. And one of the challenges for treating such lesions is how to not have too much stent protruding into the main vessel. We did IVUS to size it, and the IVUS shows that the vessel was actually 3.5, fairly large uh, posterior descending artery. And the question is how to place the stent. And what we want to avoid here is uh, going completely into the vessel and missing past part of the ostium, because that can lead to restenosis. What we want is displacement, where the stand is coming partially into the main vessel. The distal RCA was fairly large, so this shouldn't be a problem. At the same time, this completely covers the ostium of the vessel, minimizing the risk of restenosis. So that's what we did. This was a short 3.5 by 8 millimeter drag eluting stand, coming back slightly into the distal right coronary artery. It was deployed, and sometimes, actually, when we deploy the stents, we will do a contrast injection to confirm that we didn't go too far back. And this uh, provided a nice result. 
with TIM3 flow to the right coronary. The flow in the posterior lateral was not affected. We had the guide wire jail there in case that any problems should arise. We did once again IVUS to confirm that the stent was optimally placed, and yes, it was well expanded and covering the lesion entirely. This was the final uh, picture showing a nice result in the PDA and good flow in the posterior lateral vessel. So there are several lessons uh, I got from this case. First of all, in patients with complex high-risk PCI and low ejection fraction especially, if their wedge pressure is high, hemodynamic support can be useful. Second, IVUS can help uh, reduce the need for contrast, although we clearly didn't do a very good job here with 275 ml of contrast being used. Third, when it comes to challenging guide wiring advancement, changing the view can be a very useful technique to better understand where we want to go. In this case, we did try changing the guide wire, we changed the band, we did use a microcatheter, but it was only when we changed to the lateral projection, which is very useful for the right coronary mid and distal, where we're actually able to advance the guide wire into the PDA and complete our procedure. Thank you.